Good morning, church. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to find the book of Romans, and we'll be in Romans chapter 8 later in the message. Mark the spot there, and then we will be in John chapter 11. In honor of Family Worship Sunday, my daughter was in my office this morning as I was preparing my heart for the message today, and she said, I hope you don't teach long today. Uh, thanks for that, babe. I appreciate you letting me get in the, in the mood. Uh, but, I, but I do feel the weight of the message that I'm going to bring to you today, and I've got a lot that I want to cover, and so just want to get right into it today. I was recently at a pastor's conference, and the speaker in one of the sessions uh, he said, I want you to think back to a time in your life where there was a sermon or a message that someone brought that impacted your life and changed your life. And I knew immediately there were three of them. One was one that was preached by my dad when I was a kid called One Solitary Life. The second one was um, by a man named Johnny Pope who preached on the subject of hell and he compared hell in Luke chapter 16 to the island of Alcatraz and I bought the tape and I memorized the sermon. I listened to it so much as a kid. It was very powerful. But the third one was by an evangelist named David Ring. David Ring was born with cerebral palsy. I heard a message that he shared, uh, and the, the sermon title, I believe, is What's Your Problem? When you see David Ring walk to the platform, he has an obvious uh, limp to him. He can't walk very well. His speech is, is slow, and sometimes he labors to get the words out. His mind doesn't work as quickly as others. He was told by doctors that he would never have any kids, that he wouldn't really uh, be able to do much. He would be pretty much, um, you know, un unable to take care of himself. And he grew up to be called to ministry and has preached in every state in the United States, has four kids of his own, has a wonderful, beautiful life, and he proclaims Jesus passionately. And I remember hearing that message, and there's one part of the sermon where he's really building up to it, and he said, um, you know, what's your problem, healthy man? What's your problem, healthy woman? What's your problem, healthy teenager? And then he says, with his speech impediment, I can't even say Jesus correctly, and yet I proclaim him with faith and with passion. And I remember as a kid listening to that message thinking, man, I have no excuse for not serving God when you hear someone that has gone through so much difficulty. We've been in a series of messages called Unbelievable, and this series is based upon the questions and the struggles that many of us have between faith and doubt. And I ask you to submit some questions, and I'm going to share with you the two questions that were submitted that I've kind of lumped into one. But here was the first question. Why are some people blessed with miraculous healing, but some of us are stuck sick and suffering for years? The second question is, sometimes I doubt when I think of my son and brothers and sister that I have lost. Why them? God, why is it that I lost a loved one? Why is it that I'm stuck with sickness? And why is it that I'm suffering? And yet we hear of other people who experience miraculous healing. It is likely that every person in this room at some point in your life have asked a similar question. And I kind of brought them together in one, and that's simply this. Why doesn't God heal everyone? I want to begin this message by sharing this with you and tell you how I hear those questions and how I receive them. I hear them with a pastor's heart because there is pain and there is struggle and there is loss associated with those questions. And I just want you to know as your pastor that when you ask those questions, that's how I receive it. My heart empathizes with you and I feel the pain and I have walked in those shoes personally. I have a daughter that we adopted from China who has spina bifida. So I understand what it's like to have a disease that can be debilitating and cause all kind of issues. In 2013, I received a call late at night from a member of the church where I was pastoring at the time. His teenage son was changing a tire on Beltway 8, just west of uh, 59. And he had pulled his car over to the side and he was changing a tire. And a big pickup truck came around the corner and didn't see him, hit the young man's car, 
And the car was pushed upon the young man and crushed him. And I was called to come to Bentob Hospital to meet the family there. And I went immediately and, and, and went to Bentob and I stood there at the foot of that bed. And I looked at that boy and I knew that it was going to take a miracle for him to live. And I stood there at the foot of that bed with that dad grieving over what had happened to his child. And I heard groans come from a man that I had never heard before. And I stood there beside his bed and I prayed with that dad. And I prayed for that boy, praying fervently for a miracle that ultimately never came. And the boy passed. And I preached that young teenage boy's funeral. So my answer to the questions today are going to flow from the heart of a pastor who has stood by the bedside before and who has grieved with people who have suffered through illness and sickness, praying, God for, praying to God for a miracle, asking God for deliverance, and praying, but it ultimately never came. In the first few messages, I told you that we wanted to build a framework for how I would answer these questions going forward. And I will answer the questions today through these two basic points, and that is that God exists. We know that God is real. He's revealed himself in creation. He revealed himself in the word of God and in the work of Jesus Christ. And the second lens through which I will pass these questions is God's word is true. I believe that God's word is the revelation of the heart and the mind of God. And so to answer the questions today about why we suffer and why some people receive healing and others don't and why God allowed my brother or my loved one to be taken whereas others were miraculously healed, I'm going to pass those questions through the lens of God exists and his word is true. But I'm going to try to answer today with the heart of your pastor. So I'm just going to pray for a moment and we're going to get into the word of God. Will you pray with me? God, give us understanding. Help us to see your heart. Show us the truth from your word so that when we face times of suffering and difficulty, when we can't answer every question, the truths that we will learn today, I pray that they will hold us up and help us to endure. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Before we jump into the word, I want to address some of what I call the bad thinking that I hear from people often. One bad thought that I hear is, goes something like this. If God exists, God can heal everyone, but he chooses to heal whom he will. And what is implied in that statement is that God somehow plays favorites. God healed that person, but he didn't heal me. God must love that person more than they love me. And the problem with this way of thinking is that it places the blame on suffering on God. Now the second I, I think misconception about healing is this God has already healed everyone through the cross and those with enough faith can receive it and if you turn on the TV and listen to most TV preachers you will hear that sentiment echoed over and over again if you will just believe and if you will pray by faith then God will give you the healing and the problem with that thinking is that it places the blame on you because the implication is if you had more faith you would be healed. The problem with that is that doesn't line up with what we see in the Bible. I'm going to say something here that might shock you, but if you look at the Word of God, you'll find that it's true. God does not heal everyone. Furthermore, during Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus did not heal every sick person that he encountered. Now, you might have heard preachers say that before, but when you look at the, the Scripture and you look at the accounts of Jesus and his life in the Gospels, you will find that there were times when Jesus did not heal everyone in the city. Now, everywhere Jesus went, he healed people. 
when those accounts are given, but there's nowhere in Scripture that, that the Bible says everywhere Jesus went, Jesus healed everyone in the room and everyone in the city. And there's another part of the Bible that I think people skip over, and that is that faith is not evident every time God healed someone. Let me give you some examples. In, Ma in Acts chapter 3, there was a lame man at the beautiful gate. He couldn't walk. And as he saw Peter and John coming in, Acts chapter 3 and verse 3 says that he asked to receive alms. And if you know the story, he's begging, he's wanting some money. And Peter and John tell him, we don't have money to give to you, but what we have we give. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the man got up and walked. Now you tell me where the man's faith was when he said, hey, give me some money. In that story, there's no indication prior to his healing that this man believed in Jesus and asked God for healing. He asked for money. At the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5, there was a man who lay there with a lot of other people who were unable to walk and had various diseases. And Jesus comes to the man and he says, do you want to be healed? And remember what the man said? Every time this water stirred up, because that was the local legend of healing, when the water stirred up, someone gets in the pool before me. And Jesus tells him, get up and walk. And that man did not know who Jesus is. But what you see in that story is that Jesus healed that man, but there is no indication that Jesus healed all the other people who were sick and lame gathered around the pool. Jesus healed him. But there's no indication that this man's faith was in Jesus. In fact, when he was asked later, how did you get your bed, uh, how did you uh, pick up your bed and walk? He simply said, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. He didn't even know who Jesus was. And so this mindset that if you have enough faith, you're going to be healed, doesn't really pass through the lens of biblical teaching well. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus is in Capernaum. And in Mark chapter 1 and verse 34, the Bible says that Jesus healed many diseases. And there were a lot of people, it doesn't say that he healed all of them, but there were a lot of people that were at the place and Jesus withdraws to a desolate place and his disciples find him and they tell Jesus, everyone's looking for you, Jesus. And I want to read to you, it's not going to be on the screen, I want you to hear. This was Jesus' response to his disciples who had come looking for Jesus because everyone was gathered wanting Jesus to heal them. Here's what Jesus said. Let us go on to the next towns so that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. Jesus said in that moment, I'm not going back into the city to heal all those people that want me to heal them. So I want you to know that about healing. Not every person is going to be healed. But the problem with that mindset is that we place the blame on God or we place the blame on ourselves. And I heard a pastor say this one time, blame, shame, and condemnation came with the fall. When Adam and Eve sinned and God confronted Adam, what did he do? He blamed Eve. He said, the woman you gave me, she told me to eat the fruit and I ate it. And then when God confronted Eve, what did she do? She blamed the serpent and said, the serpent tricked me into taking it. You see, when the fall came, everybody began to blame. And blame and shame and condemnation were a result of the fall. So if you're thinking about healing comes with blame or shame, whether that's blaming God or blaming yourself, I want you to know that I pray today you'll have a perspective change because here is why we suffer. We live in a fallen world. If you would read the scripture through the lens of understanding that the world that you live in right now is not the world that God intended when he created it in perfection. This world that you live in is fallen. Sin suffering, death, illness, those are all a result of the fall. Now the scriptures talk about God's healing and salvation and sickness. In Psalm 103 verse 2, the psalmist wrote, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity and who heals all your diseases. Do you see it there? Salvation from our sin and iniquity and salvation from our diseases. He heals them. 
Now, he forgives us our iniquities and he heals our diseases, and that simply means that the power of sin and sickness is broken. But I want you to know something. When I was a kid, I placed my faith in Jesus Christ, and the power of sin was completely broken in my life. But guess what? I still sin. You know why? I live in a fallen world. And when Jesus came and on the cross he died, was buried, and rose again and overcame the grave, he broke the power of sickness. But guess what? I still get a cold. I still got COVID. We still have sickness. Why? We live in a fallen world. So in John chapter 11, we're going to study the story as much as we can today of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. It's one of my favorite script, uh, passages in all of the Bible. And when I read these questions, this was the first story that God brought to my heart. So in, in John 11 and verse 1, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you, what? Love is ill. This is essentially, in verse 3, their prayer to Jesus. And this is not some small sickness. This is a sickness unto death because in those days, if someone has a runny nose, you don't send word to Jesus and say, come and heal my brother, he's got a runny nose. They understood that his sickness was something that without divine intervention, without a miracle, Lazarus was going to die. And so in verse 4, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for what? The glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. But if you know this story, what's going to happen to Lazarus? He is going to die. Lazarus is going to die because Jesus delayed coming. But when Jesus made this statement, he was simply saying this, death is not the end of this story. But the last part of verse 4 is vital to understand. Jesus said what is happening to Lazarus, and ultimately by connection, what's happening to Mary and Martha is for what? It's for the glory of God so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Do you see it? But here's the question at the end of verse 4, what is the it? When Jesus says in verse 4 that he would be glorified through it, what is the it? It's the sickness of Lazarus and the suffering of this family. And I want you to just let that rest upon you for a moment. Jesus said that Lazarus' sickness was going to glorify God and glorify him. But by connection, the suffering of Mary and Martha, whose hearts are yearning for Jesus to come on behalf of their brother, they are going to suffer so that God might be glorified through their suffering. I want to read Romans eleven thirty four through 36. They'll be on the screen. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him... And through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Now that last statement in verse 36. To him be glory forever. Amen. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen at every moment. Lazarus being sick was not a surprise to God. He knows what should happen. He knows what will happen. And in all of those things, through him and to him and from him, to God be the glory forever. Amen. Now listen again to what Jesus said in John 11 and verse 4. He said to them, but when Jesus heard it, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Two things there. The sickness is for the glory of God. And number two, the sickness is for the glory of the Son of God. When's the last time that you got sick and you thought this sickness is for the glory of God? I want you to hold on to that thought for a moment. 
But Jesus said what Mary and Martha and Lazarus were experiencing was ultimately for his glory. God can receive glory even in our suffering. In fact, I want to take a chance here. How many of you have ever had your faith increase or God show you something either through your suffering or through the suffering of someone else? Just raise your hand. And I want everybody to look around the room. When we talk about, God, thank you, when we talk about God receiving glory even in our suffering, that's what we're talking about. In verse 5, I want you to see what's, what's said by John. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And that word love there is the Greek word agapao. It's the deepest, most sincere love. It's the same love that John wrote about in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world with the most deep and sincere love that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And John says that Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus with that kind of deep love. It's a love that's willing to sacrifice self for the good of others. And sometimes we make the mistake of confusing the love of God with our circumstances. Things are good, God loves me. Things are terrible, God doesn't care. God doesn't love me. God's not listening to me. God's not hearing me. I kind of would relate it to my children in this way. When we take our kids to Disney and we're riding Space Mountain and paying way too much for an ice cream Mickey Mouse pop, they think mom and dad love me. But when they're grounded, they don't say mom and dad love me. Or when they're hurting or there's a consequence, they're not thinking that, God, that their parents love them in that moment. Because their thinking is often based upon what they're feeling. And sometimes in our faith, can I be honest about me? I still haven't outgrown that at, grown, outgrown that at times. Sometimes when, I, when my life doesn't feel like Disney World, I think God doesn't care. But Jesus loved this family. But in verse 6, Jesus does something that to us seems like the opposite of love. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he immediately went to where he was and healed him. Is that what it says? Jesus stayed where he was. He does what seems to be the opposite of love. Some look at verse 6 and they say, Jesus didn't answer their prayer to come and heal Lazarus, but Jesus did answer their prayer, and his answer was, not this time, not right now. And when we receive that answer, that is a hard answer to receive from God, isn't it? He remained where he was, and while he remained there, Lazarus died. And when God doesn't answer our prayers the way that we're begging him and the way we're believing him and trusting him for, it's hard when God says, not this time. We go down to verse 14, and we find that Jesus told the disciples, Lazarus has died. And in verse 15, and for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there. There's another statement that seems so unloving. Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad we didn't go. But I want you to see at the end of verse 15, he said to, uh, excuse me, he said, I'm glad for your sake that I was not there, so that you may underline, circle, star, highlight this word, that you may believe but let us go to him. You're going to hear that word believe over and over and over again. What we find here is that God is always at work in my life for my good. We've seen earlier that God is always at work for his glory, but God is at work in our lives for his, excuse me, for our good. Jesus comes to the town and verse 17 tells us that Lazarus has been dead for four days. And I want us to pick up in verse 20. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, 
my brother would not have died. Do you hear the same question? 2,000 years ago, in the very presence of Jesus, she asked the same question that we ask. Lord, why didn't you come and heal him? Why didn't you answer our prayer? And notice in this story, as she asked him the question, verse 22, she says, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give it, give you. Do you believe that truth in verse 22? Do you kind of sense as we read that, that Martha is almost trying to muster the faith of verse 22? Because in verse 21, Jesus, if you had been here, Lazarus would still be alive. But I know that whatever you ask, God will give it to you. But I think in that moment, she is not affirming that she believes Jesus can raise Lazarus from the dead. You'll find that later in the story. But in verse 21, there's the question that we often ask of the Lord. Lord, if you had been here, my blank would blank. Lord, if you had been here, my sickness would have been healed. Lord, if you had been here, my mom would still be here. Lord, if you had been here, my job would not have been lost. Lord, if you had been here, my marriage would still be together. Lord, if you had been there, my life would be better. Lord, if you had come, I would not have suffered like I did. And look at the response of Jesus in verse 23, and we'll, we'll learn a simple and vital truth for us when we face times of suffering. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. I want you to write three words down. God is able. God is able. We sing a song here at the church. There's nothing that our God can't do, right? There's not a mountain that he can't move. And we praise the name of Jesus and say there's nothing that our God can't do. From our standpoint, I want you to think about the truth of verse 23. Which is easier, for Jesus to come and heal Lazarus or to raise him from the dead? Which is easier? He should have come, right? An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, right? An ounce of healing is better than even attempting a resurrection. But Jesus tells Martha he's going to rise again. There's a promise in verse 23, and it's the same promise made to Mary when the angel prophesied that she would give birth to a son even though she was a virgin. And it's found in Luke chapter 1 and verse 37. Here's a promise, for nothing will be impossible for God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that there's a God and there's nothing impossible with him? This is the root of our faith. Our faith rests on who God is, and what God can do, God is able. And when the answer we get and the circumstances we find ourselves in seem impossible, we need to be reminded God is able. He's greater. When our healing hasn't come, we have to approach God with the same mindset and come to him in faith knowing that God is able. And Martha responds in verse 24. I told you she's not thinking Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Notice in verse 24, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus says to her in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And Martha's response, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. Now, I want you to notice the difference, and I think it'll be on the screen here, between Martha's response to Jesus in verse 24 and verse 27. In verse 24, this is on the heels of Jesus saying, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, I know that he will rise again on the last day. And then Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever comes to me and believes in me will live. 
And he says, do you believe this? And she says in verse 27, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's come into the world. The difference between verse 24 and verse 27 is that in verse 24, Martha responds and says, Jesus, I know what you can do. You are able. But in verse 27, she responds with, Jesus, I know who you are. And his ability is connected to his identity because he is the perfect son of God who came into the world. And Martha's response here tells us something about faith. You remember in Daniel chapter 3, I love this, this picture of faith. The three Hebrew children would not bow down to the false god uh, of King, Eb Eb uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. And you remember the story. King Nebuchadnezzar uh, sentences them to death in the fiery furnace. And they said to the king in Daniel chapter 3, If this be so, our God who we serve, notice this, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But look at this. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, we will not bow down to your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now let me ask you this question. Which of those two statements is a statement of faith? God is able or but if not? Which one is a statement of faith? They both are. They are both statements of faith. Even if God, excuse me, the first one, God is able. That's what I know God can do. But if God doesn't deliver me, I still won't bow, bow down to the false gods because I know that there's only one true and living God. So both of these are statements of faith. When I'm praying over the bed of a loved one, I know that God is able to heal. But I know that God is not going to heal everyone. And I have been in the rooms where people have been prayed over and they didn't make it. And my prayer is always, God, I know that you are able to heal and I'm asking you for that. But if not, may you give the grace and the strength and the comfort that we need to accept your will be done. You see, God is able to heal me, but even if God doesn't and I have to suffer, I'm going to live by faith in him. That is a faith statement. The but if not does not mean that you've lost your faith. It doesn't mean that you, when you've come to God asking for healing, that you're asking it with less than complete faith to say, God, that might not be your will. And so if you don't heal me, I'm still going to worship you and I'm still going to serve you. Even if I don't understand, I'm still going to trust I'm going to make this statement about me. When I come to God for healing, I often ask God for a solution. And what God wants is surrender. Has that been true of you? God, I want a solution to this suffering that I'm going through right now. And what God says to me is, Robbie, are you willing to walk into the fiery furnace even if I don't rescue you from that fire? And I have to tell you, if I had been Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're walking me to that fiery furnace, and it's so hot that the soldiers died, I would not have taken another step. But they walked right into that fire knowing that God was able, but also knowing that if he didn't save them, he was still the king and God of their lives. And so Mary comes to Jesus in verses 32 to 35, and she pleads with Jesus, and I won't read all of that but i want you to look in verse 30 let's see let's look at verse 34 and he said jesus said where have you laid him look at the end of verse 33 it says that when jesus saw her weeping he was deeply moved in the spirit and greatly troubled why why was jesus spirit moved and why was he so deeply troubled and the simple reason is in verse 35 he weeps for this family and he weeps for the loved one because he has seen the effects of the fallen world and how it affects his people and Jesus wept with Mary and Martha because he saw them in their suffering 
What moved the heart of Jesus? What caused Jesus to cry? Jesus already knew here he's going to raise Lazarus. But why did he, what caused him to cry? It was the fact that he saw his people suffering. And he saw them living out what it's like to be in a fallen world. And in verse 36, the Jews said, see how he loved him. I want to point this out in this interaction with Mary and Martha. There's not one part in all of John chapter 11 where Jesus reprimanded Mary and Martha for coming to him and asking him, why didn't you come? At no point does Jesus scold them and say, why did you doubt? There's not one interaction here where Jesus tells them, don't you know who, I'm at, who I am? Don't you believe that I'm able? Don't you believe in me? Don't you trust me? When he saw them hurting, when he saw them suffering, he wept for them. And this verse, verse 35, gives us another truth, that God loves you. Sometimes as a parent, we want to give our kids a pain-free life, don't we? But we understand as parents that sometimes our children experience pain and it's for their good. It's hard to say that, but it's true. One of the truths that we lose sight of when, we're, when our healing doesn't come is this truth that God loves me, he cares for me. Sometimes we need to be reminded of Jesus in John chapter 11 weeping with Mary and Martha because of their loss and be reminded that even in the midst of their suffering, God still loved them and cared for them. The simple reason why we suffer is we live in a fallen world. Why was Lazarus sick? We live in a fallen world. Why did he die? We live in a fallen world. Why do you suffer physical uh, sickness and mental sickness, emotional sickness? Why are there injustices and hurts and war and loss and anxiety and depression and death? The simple reason is we live in a fallen world. I wish I had time to read it, but in Romans chapter 8, if you look there at Romans chapter 8 and verse 18, you'll find that creation is groaning. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And if you look down at verse 22, it'll be up here on the screen. Go to the next slide there. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. What, what God is saying through the pen of Paul is simply this, that when we look around our world and we see all the hurt and the brokenness and the sickness and the death and the injustice, creation is groaning for the deliverance that is to come in Christ. But later, Paul says here that we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our what? Our bodies. I'm looking forward to the day when we're in the presence of God forever and there is no more sickness and no more suffering and no more tears and no more dying. That's what Paul is saying. Our bodies yearn for that redemption that's in Christ. But notice this in verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with what? Patience. We endure the suffering of this present age knowing that God is always at work in my life for his glory and my good. If you look in John eleven thirty seven, 37, you'll see others doubting. Couldn't Jesus have healed Lazarus? But I want us to just kind of draw this to a conclusion today by looking at John chapter 11, verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew that you always hear me, but I said on account of the people standing around that they may what? Believe that you sent me. Why didn't Jesus heal Lazarus when they first got word, when he first got word? It's simply because God is always working toward an end. And that end is his glory and my good. And God is always working to build faith in you and to bring others who have never believed to faith in Jesus Christ. If you look in verse 45, there were people that stood there as Lazarus came out of that tomb. And the Bible says they believed in who Jesus was. Do you see it? Would they have believed if Lazarus 
had just been raised off a sick bed? Maybe not. But God knew. And he was at work to bring about faith. Listen, miracles like Lazarus walking out of a tomb, that increases and grows our faith, doesn't it? But don't lose sight of this as well. Suffering will help our faith grow as well. And suffering will not only grow our faith, but it can ultimately at times point others to Jesus. C.S. Lewis said this, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. Pain is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. The questions we often ask related to healing are the questions why. Why didn't Jesus come? Why doesn't Jesus heal me? Why am I left suffering when others are healed? And I feel the weight of that question. I do. And I have to tell you that the answer in my heart and in my mind and what I see in the Bible is that we live in a fallen world. But the sorrow and the suffering that we endure in this moment of life Paul said in Romans chapter 8, pales in comparison to the weight of glory that is to be revealed. I'd like to propose a different question to you if you're asking the question why. I often encourage people to ask the question how. How can God use my sickness and suffering to strengthen my faith? How can God use this to bring others to faith in Christ? How can God use my suffering and what, I'm, what I seem to be kind of cursed with to strengthen the faith of others? How can God use this for his glory and to glorify the Son of Man? You see, when there's healing, God receives the glory. But when you watch somebody walk through suffering with great faith, God still gets the glory. God is always at work for his glory and my good. I'll share this with you. Your suffering can tell the story of hurt or of hope. And it's Jesus that makes the difference. It's where our faith rests that makes the difference. In John chapter 9, a man was born blind, and Jesus walked by and healed him. And we always focus on that moment of healing, and it's a wonderful moment of healing. But we forget that every day of his life for over 40 years, he was blind. The man in Acts chapter 3 that was at the beautiful gate and was healed, for over 40 years he had been paralyzed. And we focus on the moment when he rises up and he's able to jump for the first time. And that miracle and that, that miracle brings glory to God, but the suffering that he endured brings glory to God because God redeems the suffering for our good and for his glory. Would God allow a man named David Ring to lose his parents when he's 14 years old, be born with his umbilical cord wrapped around his neck so that he was deprived of oxygen for minutes after his birth? Would God allow that man to have cerebral palsy so that a little boy would hear him teach and would hear the power of the question, what's your problem, healthy teenager? To hear those words come out of a man who could barely speak the name of Jesus because of his speech impediment. Would God allow him to suffer for an entire lifetime with no healing so that he as a preacher could go to every state in the union and preach the gospel to tens of thousands of people in his life? Would God allow that to happen? Yes, he would. And it would be for his glory and for my good. But could God heal someone miraculously of a tumor or of a disease? Absolutely, he can. But whatever God chooses, whether to save me from the fire and I know he's able, or he says, stand in the fire and I'm with you, God is glorified and it's for my good. I'll never forget at the end of his message, David Ring would always sing the song, Victory in Jesus. And then when he would get to the second verse, he would say, I love this verse. I heard about his healing. 
of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and he calls the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. And he loved me ere I knew him. And all of my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Would you stand today with your heads bowed and with your eyes closed? I want to pray over us. We're going to have a verse of, a song of response today. And our staff and our elders and pastors are going to be just kind of stationed throughout the room. Jeff and Ryan are at the back. Ron, be over here. I'll be up at the front. And maybe you've been suffering. And maybe today during the song of response, you just want to come grab us by the hand and say, will you kneel and pray with me? I need healing. And we're going to pray that God is able. And we're going to ask for that for you and with you today. So let me pray, and then we'll respond as God leads. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love and your kindness. I feel... <sighs> the weight of the hearts of your people, especially those who have suffered and those who are suffering... I pray that the truth of your word today might in some way remind them that you are able to heal. Until we breathe our last breath, you are able. And that you would remind them today from your word that you love them and that you weep with them as we suffer in this fallen world. So our hearts just groan today with creation for the redemption that is to come. But until that time, help us to wait with patience. I pray for your healing power in the lives of those who need it. And I know that you're able, God, and we're asking you for it. But help us to also ask in faith today. But if not, you're still our God and you're still our King. And we will not bow our lives to another. So whatever you need to speak to our hearts today, God, we cry out to you. We love you. And we thank you for your love. We thank you for what you can do. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.